Hello and welcome to Juicy Scoop. Very excited to be talking to a new author. Taylor Higgins has written Between the Stitching and Juicy Scoopers have told me about you. I realized you had reached out to me before, but then I reached out to you. This is a juicy book about an unfortunate love story you had. So thank you so much for coming on Juicy Scoop. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. So just tell us a little bit about, you know, how you fell in love when you realized that this person was not the person who you thought he was. And, you know, just just start from the beginning and I'll just we'll just get into it. All right. So we met and it was our relationship took off really fast. Like we were talking marriage really quickly and it was just, we were both really caught up in each other and we were excited. It was fun. It was just, it was fast. Um, we met in New England. He was playing baseball up in my neck of the woods. I'm from Massachusetts and uh, we just hit it off instantly. Where'd you meet him but, at? Where'd you meet him at? Uh, we met. We met in, at an event, at a charity event at the time. I was actually Miss Massachusetts, and he was a, just a local baseball player in the community. And we just met, and then we started DMing after, because that's how love stories are born these days. And, okay, so wait uh, a minute. So you're you're the pageant girl. You're absolutely yes. gorgeous, so I'm not surprised. You're the best teeth I think Thank I've you. ever seen in my life. And Thank you. Were, did you grow up in pageants, or was this something you just did at, at the fly? No. It was my first one and I just, someone was like, you should do it. And I was like, no, I would never. And then I did it and I won and it was, it was amazing. It changed my life, obviously, but I met this guy and now I have a book about him. Okay. So you meet him and he's hot, I assume. In the book, we call him Scott Skyler. So you meet Skyler. Scott and he immediately, what, starts pursuing you? Yes. Like zero to 100. Um, he's just like, I can see you being my wife. I'm talking like a few weeks in. And typically, I mean, we might think that would be a red flag. But to me, I was like, this is just, I, I couldn't, we, we were so similar and I just couldn't help but go along with everything really. Um, so we met, just started taking off. But after a few months, like little things, little red flags started Nothing that like worth making you leave someone over, but just little details. Like we couldn't have an argument without him crying uncontrollably on the floor. And I was just like, all right, there's maybe maybe there's something in the past. We'll address that, but not right now. Um, like, well, but there what, was were this, what was an argument that would put him in such a tizzy? And how old were you guys at this time? So he was 25 and I was just in my early 20s. I was about 20 when this was happening. So he was a little bit older than me at, at, to a point where I thought he could control himself. But something as small as just not like he was very, um, he obeyed his mother. And in the book, I kind of question whether him and his mother had some sort of like a romantic, it's very, very, it's deranged, but they had this hold on each other. And if I didn't obey what his mother wanted, uh, then we would just, it would cause a huge fight. It would ruin the day if we didn't Like, can you give mom, me an so. example of how the the mom's influence was in your relationship? Yes. So she was all, she needed to be with us always. So if we were in her presence, she would have to be there. And if I was like, Hey, let's go on a date ourselves and mom couldn't come, it would be a problem. Um, if mom wanted to sit with us on the couch and cut his toenails while we were watching a movie and cuddling, um, things like that. And I was like, Hey, this is so weird. She'd be like rubbing his toes with lotion after giving him a, a pedicure. And I was just sitting there and I, and then if I confronted him about that, he would be like, I don't know why everything with you is a problem. And I'm like, I, just stuff like that. And it got worse progressively. Wait, um, was she he had an only child? No, but he was the oldest of three boys. And okay. it was like they didn't have other sons. It was just like just him. Because They might as was, well not be. Do you think because he was the golden boy, because he was the successful professional baseball player? Yes. And the family came from like small town Georgia, uh, didn't have much. And they thought, well, hey, if this guy makes it big we'll be able to live large, larger than we have been at least. And at that time, was he wealthy being that he was a professional baseball player? No. So this is what's very deceiving about it. He was just, he was playing in minor league baseball for the Boston Red Sox organization, but he hadn't made it yet to the MLB. He hadn't made it to the actual roster. So he was playing in Pawtucket, Rhode Island, where they have the affiliate team. Um, and he was making not even $15,000 a year. He had no money. That was the thing. And his mom, they clung on to him like, well, he might make it. He might have money someday. So that was their way out, basically. And did you introduce him to your parents? And what did they think? Yes. So when he... He stayed at my house a lot, too, because he was always traveling. They live in hotels, those guys. Um, and my parents, they, welcome in, they welcomed him into our home with open arms. And they, they liked him. I mean, if you met him today, he's very shy, timid. He's attractive, obviously. Uh, there was something that led me to him. And he's quiet. So for him to have this, like, second, third, fourth identity, 
it blows people's mind because Wait, we haven't you don't gotten see it. we haven't gotten to these other identities. So no. So you're keeping your mouth shut over the mother son pedicure sessions on the couch, and mm -hmm. and then what would cause him to get so emotional over a, what you think was just a, a simple argument? What would be the what would be the argument? So because he was from Georgia, say I wanted to go spend a holiday in Boston with my family because we hadn't seen them. I would want to take him away from his family for a short period of time. And he was like, hey, I'm always on the road. I should be with my family. And something as small as me just wanting to spend Christmas with my parents would upset him to the point where he would throw himself on the floor. And then eventually it got obviously there were bigger problems down the road, things like, you know, finding out about these second, fourth identities. And that would really uh, cause bigger problems for us. And he would just explode on the ground. He would come apart just because I would tap into who he actually was. So it started so, with small things like a pedicure, but then it, it just grew. <laughs> so how long were you guys dating before you found something that was really deceptive and explain what the deceit was and all of that. Right. So two months in, I just moved to Georgia for, we were just staying there for a few weeks. I moved all my stuff there. I multiple suitcases, whatever. Um, and I, I get a message on Facebook from one of his exes. And she was like, Hey, uh, he showed up at my house last night. I need you to know this. He, when I have a, she said that I have a young daughter at home and he showed up to my house and he was crying in my driveway because he wants to be with me again. And I know that you just came to Georgia because I was very vocal uh, online, of course, as most unhappy people are um, about my relationship on social media. So she knew I was there and she said that. And I'm like, so I confronted him. I was like, I showed him the message and he was like, people just want to ruin our happiness. Uh, gave me the whole runaround. And I was, I started packing my stuff because she had screenshots and his phone number was in the text and I saw it. And, uh, and he just, that's when he was on the floor crying, uh, sobbing. Make, he was, just, was basically saying that nobody in, in the world wants him to be happy. And this isn't the first time this has happened. I should have left then, but I didn't. So did you believe him that this girl is crazy trying to ruin his life? Or what was your thought? Part of me... Part of me thinks that at the time I did think that she was just jealous. They had dated briefly and I was just new and I didn't know if they had, I mean, I knew that she, he had met her, her daughter. I didn't know what connection there was, but I knew that they dated briefly. And then he went away to baseball. Baseball took him away from her. And I, I, it felt like there was unfinished business. So I didn't know if she was just upset over that. And I, but I stayed regardless. I stayed. I didn't listen to that. I thought, yeah, hey, you can, anybody can make a fake text message. Okay, so you're continuing on. Now, what are you living off of if he's making so little and you're dropping everything to be with him for weeks here and there? Yeah, so we would stay at his parents' house, my parents' house. We were, I mean, we were very, very poor. I just started a career in real estate. I didn't have much. I was in school. Um, so whatever I had, I had some savings and my parents really sponsored the relationship because, I mean, it's not like we had to do much. We were living at parents to parents' house, but uh, whatever travel we did have, my mom and dad did help us a lot. Okay. Okay, so then when's, what's the next, um, like, bombshell that happens? I would say, oh, there's so many. I would say that his personality started to change in the fact that I just noticed little things, like he was bringing his phone to the shower with him or uh, phone was always flipped over, just like those little details that, you know, I just, it didn't sit well with me. Um, and then my, in the middle of all of this, my, my grandmother, sorry, passed away. So I kind of just left that whole situation on the back burner. And I was like, hey, I really need you to, I need a shoulder to cry on right now. So we fly home to Boston. We're going to my grandmother's wake. And he's like, throwing a tantrum in the parking lot. He's like, I haven't eaten today. You need to get me food. So everything was always about him, especially like uh, weddings, funerals, whatever it was, it was always about him. And then, so that there was that my cousin was also getting married that same week and he ruined her entire wedding. And that was an absolute, just, it was just terrible. Yeah. I want to hear because... about that. Cause I saw a photo where yes. you wrote something. It's you walking down the aisle as a bridesmaid yes. and you're like, see it. I'm smiling here, but I was mm -hmm. terrified and stressed because I knew he would freak out. I mean, that I was walking down the aisle with a groomsman, which it's like, you know, you, you get set up with what other groomsmen is like your height or whatever. There's not even like, you don't sit with these people. You don't, I mean, walk down the aisle and, but you knew he was playing this weird jealousy game already with you, putting yes. all this extra stress on you and, and putting you in a situation where... There's nothing you could do. So you so you already knew him well enough that you were like, he's going to be weird about me walking down the aisle with this guy who's like not great looking, just average, whatever. No offense to the guy that was in the photo, but 
<laughs> no, it's true. And he all day long, he was upset because I had my hair and makeup done for the wedding. And he was like, why do you need to look good? like one of those guys? Like, who are you trying to impress? What do you need to look good for? And I can't tell you how common this is just from being on TikTok and establishing a presence with a book. People are like, I've gone through identical things like this. This man exists in multiple forms. So back to the wedding, he was upset with me for getting my hair and makeup done. And we were already, the day was already ruined, but then I had to walk down the aisle with another man and I'm like, here we go. So he's in the audience and he's and he's like shooting me daggers as I walk down the aisle. And from there on, it was just, he hit the bar heavy after that. And he ruined the rest of the night for my family. That was in mourning. Um, so it was, how did he ruin the rest? So of the night? we were, so we got into the reception and he would not talk to me and I had, and he was upset with me because I had to go wait in the back with the bridal party because we were about to be introduced into the room. And that was just setting him off. And I'm watching him drink beer, beer after beer after beer. And uh, he doesn't, he doesn't drink well. So that was uh, upsetting to me, but I come out and then you usually dance, you share a first dance quickly with while the bride and groom dance. And I had to dance briefly with this other man and that set him off. So I went to go cry in my car for a moment because I was having like a breakdown and he followed me out and he was trying to get me back in. And we ended up having this huge altercation in the parking lot. And the relationship of like does turn a bit. Of like screaming yeah. and stuff? Did anyone screaming see and it? He was my uncle chased after us because he was like, something's not right. So people were like, what's going on with them? Um, and so my ex now is he's trying to get me out of my car. I just wanted a moment. I'm just I'm sitting in my car because it's like middle of winter and uh, up in Boston. And she's trying to get me out and I pull away and my hand hits the car door. And now I'm gushing blood. I'm bleeding all over my dress, um, bleeding all over him. And then my family starts to come outside, the bride, the groom, everyone's coming outside and they're like, what's going on? And I'm in my bridesmaid's dress, just like, it looks like I was like murdered. It was, I was bloody everywhere. And so my parents were like, get in the car. We're going home. You left? We left. I couldn't how, go back inside. I was how like, how far into ruined. the reception was it? Did you, had you guys even eaten yet? No, they were just starting to serve dinner. Mm-hmm. Yep. So your parents take you home and they're are they like, all right, what the hell is going on with this dude? Yeah. That, yeah. So, and, and the next morning and now this guy could tell you a story and make you believe it. And so the next morning he was like, I just drank too much. He was so apologetic. But they it, there were so many little things I couldn't even explain to him. I felt like I didn't even know what hit me. Um and but he he told a good story and that's I think what kept me there for so long. It sounds it sounds so foolish and crazy, but he was so good at making me question my own reality, and that's what I think emotional abuse. I'm a, I'm a huge advocate for emotional abuse because when you're just beaten to a pulp over time and those little it's like I feel like it's like chipping away at you, and then you're confronted with an opportunity to leave, and it's like you almost don't want to leave because you're just so broken already. I couldn't face the pain of leaving him, and I know that's a very distorted way of thinking, but it's it's my rationale really and um i mean it just sounds like you're like dealing with a toddler like between rolling on the ground and crying to like looking at it like a toddler and being like oh god he's you know eating too much sugar he's gonna yeah. have a breakdown he didn't have a nap today like the amount of stress that you yes. that you have when you're in one of these relationships where you really are constantly thinking is he in a good mood is something gonna piss him off like you're juggling so much mm -hmm. extra stuff when you should yes. just be like the cute bridesmaid and having fun. Um, so, okay. So then, so this wedding thing happens, then, then where are we in this? So you accept him back, you get your dress dry cleaned or throw it away. And then throw that away. And then I start by posting a lovely photo of us on Instagram, of course, telling the world that we had such a happy and beautiful time. Um, and I was so afraid to confront my family after that, but they, everyone was very forgiving and they just, they didn't see the behind the scenes. Luckily, it just looked like I, it was just an accident. And that's what we played it off as. I kept him, I kept going in the relationship. Um, and then it got worse. Surprise. Um, I found, he ended up going back home by himself. And then I found his uh, laptop in his closet, which he never used. And I was doing his laundry, wanted to make it special when he came back home, everything's all set for you. And I open up his laptop and Skype is just magically opened and we don't Skype. So I was like, oh, this is gonna be fun. And there's just lists of women and uh, different porn sites and just all these names. And then there's also men's names too. So I was like, hmm, interesting, thought nothing of it. But then I was like, I, I don't know. Um, and then he so actually- So do you think he was um, also frequenting um, like gay sites and gay men. I now know that to be true. At the time, okay. I didn't. 
but yes. So he was doing it with men and women. Um, and so I, but luckily for me, he recorded everything that he did. So he would uh, have these chats like we're doing now. Uh, I could see the, the person's face and it would be a split screen. I would see the person, I would see him or a version of him uh, below the waist. And, and I would watch him play out and he was so dominant. He would just like bark these orders to these women and they would comply. And there was no, he didn't have a type. It, there, you could be, I mean, skin color, weight, height, size, like hair color, like nothing mattered. There was no age. Age was a huge thing. Um, found some underage girls, found some girls that were much, much older, like grandmothers. And they were very proud to be grandmothers because they talked to him about his grandchildren on these chats. It was so disturbing. Military wives, like people that were just really lonely. There was there was no in between. I didn't did know. You, did you witness any guy on guy action? No, I didn't okay. see anything from the from the men. So I was like. That was, I mean, at least I didn't want to see that. Um, but it was hard enough to watch the women and just see what I saw anyways. But they would undress for him and he would make them perform in what in, in a way that he wanted to. And I was watching this. And of course, I'm like, I'm watching it. My mom walks in. She's like, hey, what's going on? And I shut my computer and I'm like, nothing. I felt like I was watching like live porn and uh, I'm listening to my my who I thought would be my husband bark orders to a stranger online who's triple my age and she's undressing herself and she's unsure of it. And she's like scared and he's loving it. It's just, it was terrible. And, and then was when he, he would, were these paid women? Like was this, was he no. paying for it or just all girls that just thought he was cute enough to FaceTime with? It was just, it was just random people. And I knew it yeah. wasn't paid because they would be like, as soon as he got what he wanted from it, what he needed when they completed what he needed, uh, he would just be gone. Like the thing would end and they would be like, hello, you still there? We got to talk later. And he, it was just dead. Like you're dead to me. And so I'm like, he, there's, he has no emotional connection to these people. So this isn't real, but what, what do you need? So and what was I, your sex life like, like very normal and, and normal frequency or was he ever trying to do kinky stuff with you? Not even, no, he was, it was normal. Um, we didn't have a crazy sex life because he couldn't last for long. It was very short lived, uh, his performances. So well, maybe it, because like, he was not on even... the, do you ever think cause he was like ejaculating with all these other women, like eight times a day? Yeah, maybe. I mean, I would think that he wouldn't even have time for me, but he was the one that to always initiate it. And I was like, after that, I was like, damn, why? Like, how do yeah. you, how do you feel like it? You know? So, so uh, what did you do after the discovery of the laptop? After I saw that, he came back. I made him fly home to Boston. His truck was in my driveway, so I knew that he had to come back anyways. Um, I made him fly back because I wanted him to waste money on the plane ticket. And I did wanted you to act like everything was, Did you act like everything was normal yeah. to get him back? Okay. Yes. Yep. I played. Okay. It was like a day. And, and I just made made it like nothing was wrong. Because if I confronted him over the phone, he would shut down completely and like block me. And I would be up late emailing him when I shouldn't have been things like that he just shut down you couldn't t tell him he was wrong ever one of those people so he comes back I make him fly home and when he comes back from the airport I didn't pick him up um, he arrived at my house my parents house and uh, the lap my laptop is open and I just start playing one of the videos that was pre-recorded and he charges at me slams the laptop closed and tries to tell me that his brother that was his brother that was his younger brother he was using his iPad and this whole story and I did not believe him at all, uh, of course, but because I, I know what his manhood looks like. Um, but it was the way he was able to, to tell a story. It was almost like I was already it, now we're, we're like a year and a half in. This isn't like this was over a gradual period of time. So um, I was already, I feel like, down and out. And at this point, he could make me believe whatever I wanted to hear just to keep him there. And at any point that he was telling you that it was his brother, was any point of you going, well, maybe his brother and he do have matching dicks? Wait, I did see a face along with it or? It was always like dark and it was always below the waist. And I knew it, I know it was him, obviously, because he would, and he would be like, sorry, I got to go to baseball lessons. Or he would just like yeah. leave little hints in the chats. And but so I knew it was him. But it still made you question yourself. Yes. Yes. Because I was so gone. I, com I lost myself to this man that didn't exist. And it was, I was in a very low place. And even still after that whole finding, he left and we, we broke up for a little while, but that wasn't the end of our story. Now at this point, you're not engaged yet. Did you ever get no. engaged? No, okay. no, we didn't. Okay. So you break up with him and then what happens? He goes home for a little while and, uh, we spend a few months apart and then it's now around Christmas time and he surprises me with a Pomeranian 
and he's super sorry. I've grown, I've changed whatever I needed to hear. And I still being very much in love with him. I said, let's give this another try. And well, I, I just wasn't done with him. Pomeranians um, are pretty cute. Yeah. Do she's the love the, of my life. So I was like, do you still yeah, have the dog? Yep. Oh, oh, I, oh, of course I have the dog. <laughs> of course I have the dog, but yes. Um, so that, that, that got me back. Um, and it was, I would, I kept finding like little portions of, for another example. So now we get back together. I go to spring training with him, which is in Fort Myers, Florida, where the Red Sox have their spring training and it's Valentine's day. She's frozen. Hold on. Lingerie photo shoot. And I do a little picture book. Good. Wait, it was, it, it, sometimes it gets frozen, but what's good about zoom is it, it'll, it'll collect itself, but just start again with oh, okay. your story about, um, you know, it's Valentine's day. Yeah. So okay. we, we get back together. It's now Valentine's day and I want to do something cute for him. So I have a little photo shoot done. I wanted to do like lingerie pics, just something, something cute. And I have a little photo book made for him and it's not, we go out to dinner and I, we get back to our, our room where we were staying. And I said, I have something for you. I was so excited to show him and he opens the book and he's so disgusted that I was half naked or not really even naked. I was just, I was, I was, it was, it was nice. It was tasteful. Um, but I did that in front of another man because the photographer was in fact a man and that ruin the night. And we had this huge altercation. He ripped apart the room. He opens the closet doors, the dresser drawers. He's now throwing clothing everywhere. Pack your suitcase. You need to leave. All because of the concept of me being in a room with another male, like a male photographer. And I've heard people like people on TikTok will say something similar has happened to me. I've gone to Sephora to have my makeup matched on my face. And the, the guy was a man that was doing the, the foundation match. And that set the man off. And I was like, well, if some guy's so, doing makeup at Mac, he's obviously not straight, too. So it's like anything to just but he's a guy. torture your girlfriend and yes. constantly make yes. it like you did something wrong to hurt me. You yes. hurt me. You're and it was just like, yeah, everything was just always, um, he was never like wrong in anything. And it was just this, it was really just a confusing time because. I didn't know why he was, and, and all, all in all, I, I just kept thinking, well, he has that weird childhood. His upbringing was very strange. His parents relied on him a lot. I thought his past made him the way he was. And I was like, I can help you. I can show you what love is. I want to, you're broken, obviously, but why? Like, let's get to the bottom of that. And um, nothing I did, like there was a problem with literally everything. And I think he fed off of the control and just watching me fall apart. I think there was, there was enjoyment in that. So, like, prior to the Valentine's Day experience, at, you guys are getting along, you're having fun. Are you sneaking and checking on his phone? Are you still suspicious? Like, what is that like when you've already discovered such, you know, crazy stuff? Yeah, I was definitely um, on edge. Like, I feel like those things never left me, and that's wasn't healthy for me for me to even be still dating him, of course. But he would do things. This is how like specific he was about his phone and this uh, another red flag, but he would take a shower and if it was um, needed to be charged or whatever, and it, or if he needed to leave it for a second, he would wrap the charging cord like around it several times, um, put it in a certain position, wipe the, sc the screen clean of any fingerprints. And so if it were touched in any way, he would know. And he was very aware, like he was very intelligent, which didn't help me, but he would make sure that I, if I touched it, he would know. And I would know if, and but did, would, did you have his password? Like even if he didn't do all that stuff, would you have been able to figure it out? Yes, um, but I I really didn't have an opportunity, and he made sure I didn't have an opportunity to. I, I compared to him and people like him who, who do abuse in this form. Uh, they keep you in like a bubble, and they don't want you to socialize with people, and they don't want you to really have access to many things. And my world was so small, and it. He just cornered me into a place where I thought that I was, he was all I had. It was just, I didn't have many opportunities to keep uh, going and, and checking on him. Now, would, what were your fights like? Would you scream back at him? Was it both of you screaming? Did it ever get physical? Like, what was it like? So I'm very calm. Like, I, I don't, I barely even raise my voice. I won't throw things. kind of just like, well, he leaves. He's one of those people that just, well, then I'll leave. Well, then I'll just go home. Um, 
but I would be very calm. And then it did turn physical. Uh, he would, it's, of course, it would just start small like anything. And then it would get, grow into much bigger problems. Um, but it, yeah, it did. It did get physical. Ever to the point where you like wanted to call the cops or anything? Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. We had some, the day that he came back to the, not to jump around, but the day that he came back to the house, to that laptop scene in the book, um, I was insulting his parents because I'm like, they enable you to just continue on like this. Like I, I reached out to his parents begging for help. Like we can get him therapy. He just needs something. There's obviously something wrong. And they were like, Taylor, no, there's nothing wrong. Uh, you, you guys will figure it out. And um, I, so I'm like, your parents, they enable you. And then he gets so upset when I, it like strikes a chord. It's like I'm stabbing him in the chest when I say anything about his parents. His parents can't be touched. And uh, he throws me into a wall and, you know, dry, this is at my parents' house and drywall falls to the floor. And he's just like so upset that I could be insulting his parents that he actually picked me up by my shirt and he headbutted me like so hard that I saw stars. And uh, I was just laying on the floor and he let, he walked out of my parents' house right after that. And I didn't, that's when I didn't see him for a few months. Um, and, and it's very you, disturbing. Did, and you I, tell, I, did you tell your parents what happened that he headbutted no. you and- how did you explain the uh, broken drywall in the house? I said that I was moving stuff around and that, cause it was just like, um, it was like almost like a perfect circle from where it happened. And I said that I was just moving stuff around to get his, him situated. And uh, it was fine. My mom patched it up. It was totally fine. No one even, even questioned it. But then and you I, did, but then you did tell them, but, oh, we're not seeing each other anymore. And then he shows up mm -hmm. two months later with the dog. Yep. So now at this point, is he still only making 15000 a year? Yeah. Yep. He never really. So he had ended up having a career ending arrest and he never ended up making it into the major leagues because of this, this arrest. What was the arrest? DUI. Oh. Mm -hmm. And were you with him when he got that DUI? No. Nope. He was kind of a, a closet drinker, closet smoker. I didn't know him to be a drinker. Like we'd go out and he'd be like, oh no, I, I'm good. Coke. That's fine. And, uh, but he just had this another whole identity that I didn't know. And he would keep alcohol under the seat of his car and um, cigarettes and whatever else. And the, what they don't tell you in baseball is that they only test for certain drugs and a lot of narcotics aren't tested for. And I do expose a lot of the MLB in this because there's a lot of drug dealing that goes on in the system. So while I was dealing with his like sexual addictions and his multiple personalities and whatever the hell was going on at mom and dad's house, he also had an addiction to pain pills that weren't tested for in the system um, and alcohol that, you know, no, of course you can drink. So he had, a, he was juggling a lot. And if I told anybody I would risk ruining his career and I looked at it as, well, if I ruin his career, then we have no future. He's going to have, not that he makes any money now, but I mean, there goes the rest of our lives. What is he going to do? He had no other skills. He'd been playing baseball for almost 10 years at that point. So. And so then what was the moment where you're finally like free of him and started to really realize the kind of demented relationship you were in? So the last time I, I knew I had to leave, and this is weird because I, I went through the physical abuse and all of that, like all of those weird situations. The thing that got me to leave was we were in at spring training in Florida still. Um, this is right after that Valentine's Day. And I asked him, because like you said, we, where are we making our money? I said, hey, can you get me? He's going to Dunkin' Donuts. Can you get me a bagel for breakfast? I'm starving. And he said, Taylor, I can't support you. I made that very clear that I, I don't have the money to support you. Ask your mom, like go ask somebody else to and so I watched him. He went into Dunkin' Donuts, got himself a coffee, a muffin, bake, whatever he got. And I, he get, got back in the truck and ate it in front of me. And I went right home and I, I was like, mom, please help me. I have to get home and I have to figure out a way out. And I started planning. It took me a few weeks to get like a flight. And I had so much stuff because I packed like a maniac. And I had to plan a, basically my escape. And it was like a week or two after that, I ended up flying home. And it, I drove him to the field that day. Like everything was normal. I kissed him goodbye because I didn't want to make waves and cause a fight and I flew home and he came home that day and never even asked me why I left or where I was. My stuff was gone and he was ne never even questioned it. He never texted you again? Nothing? I had posted a picture on Instagram uh, a few days prior and he didn't, he didn't have an Instagram. Um, he had a, a Twitter. Twitter was big back of yeah. bigger back then back a few years ago. And um, he was big on Twitter. So I posted on Instagram a picture from Florida <laughs> fight over that not why did you leave this was the same day that I left he just said why would you ever post a picture if you like that on on Instagram whose attention do you want and I'm just like 
Because the picture was uh, like sexy or whatever. It was just a regular selfie, just of my face. Nothing crazy. And so when he wrote that, did he, he that was and the one text you got? Like a few days after you had yep, left? Never. He never actually said, where are you? It was the same day. It was the night that I, I, I was driving home from the airport. My parents had picked me up and I got in the car and he was like, he never, act, never said, where are you? Where did you go? He just never said anything. And then I didn't even know how he got home because I drove him in his truck. And then when you got home and your stuff, were you like, okay, to the parents, I, I'm really done. And were they like, okay, you really need to be done, Taylor. Like with everyone now, like we're not going to yeah. let you, we don't care how cute the next dog is. Like we're done with what he tries yeah. to do and when you back. Yes. And, um, yeah. And my, my dad, go ahead, go ahead. No, you go ahead. My oh, I was going to say my dad actually, my dad said, um, the reason why we never made you choose, like we never said you can't see him anymore is because we knew that you would follow him anywhere just because that was the, that was the mindset I was in. And he said that I'd rather have you here where we could help you close to us in Massachusetts or wherever. Um, and knowing that we could come to you if you needed help rather than let you follow him around the country. Cause he was in a different city every single week. And so when did you like realize, did you go to therapy? When did you realize what, kind of relationship you were in and decide to write about it and share about it how did that come about I was it was after we had broken up and I was trying to I was in that rebuilding that ugly place of just finding who I was and starting from nothing and I felt like my whole world had imploded on me and I just didn't know where to begin so I was hesitant to tell people why we actually broke up because it was heavy I didn't know how to just have they were like what happened and because you look so great on Instagram and then um I'm like well he has seven different lives but um I started to, like just giving little bits and pieces of it and the more I talked about it the more people I didn't even know or f people I did know would say hey something like that has actually happened to me too like identical things and I was like really because I feel like this guy is like one in a million like no one could possibly be this bad and, they, and I was starting to bring people to tears just by sharing why we had broken up and I was like I think that this is a lot more common than than what I have originally thought and uh I mean, this guy was like a narcissist, true and true, and that word is overused, and I don't like to say it, but it's true. Like he was, he lived for himself, and there are people out there that are just so similar to him. And I've unlocked a world on TikTok, as you know, I've seen, I'm sure, some of my videos on TikTok, and the the amount, the hundreds of thousands of people that are like, I'm reading your book, and I'm verbatim, like word for word, I am going through these exact same scenarios, and I was like, really, that's that's scary. And so, what do you think it is? Is it is it a certain type of guy? Is it, or do you think they're aware of it? Like, do you think any of these people are fixable? Like, is there anything that if the person's in it before they leave that they could maybe try to fix it? Or what is your opinion of it? Since you have talked to so many other people that have been in these weird relationships. I always ask what was their upbringing like? If anybody seems like damaged, I'm like, what, what is mom and dad still married? What's going on in the home? Um, nine out of 10 times, there is something in like the past, there's some sort of trauma. If it's not in the home, it's definitely something else that, that, you know, it's a death or something big has happened in their life. And I feel like people now have such a hard time healing. We don't heal properly. We just rely on other people. We're just jump to another relationship. We don't take the time, do the work to figure out what we need. And I think to an extent, people like that, that are just hurting so bad, prey on, on innocent people. I think that they, they take advantage of like people's kindness and, I also think there's, you know, like when you first start dating somebody and there's that, like that new, that introduction, you're like, Hey, what's, who are you? What's going on? Like, what, tell me about yourself. And I feel like they like that because they can hide who they really are for a short period of time in that. And for a short while, somebody will be so interested. And so like, and that was the, the beginning of our relationship. It was awesome. It was, and he was so great. He was everything I needed. And I think they were, people like that are addicted to that initial stage. And then you get so wrapped up in it. You're like, shit, I can't leave now. And and it's, it's too late. Right. You're chasing those first three perfect months for another yes. year and a half when you should have left yes. at month four. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so do you have any idea where he is now? How many years has yes. it been since you've been broken up with him? It's been about five. Okay. Um, 
so I, every single girl that has come after me has reached out and they were like, he's doing the same. And it's now year after year goes by. And I'm like, they're like, same. I read your book, same. He, um, he, yes, like has not strayed. They're like the way you described the family, everything about the conversation, like same. And I was like, okay. So he elopes with a woman and um, they get divorced two months after. And then next thing I know, another girl is pregnant. And I'm actually very friendly with her. I like to think that he chooses pretty decent people. They um, always do. And the woman, <laughs> they always do. They always do. And the woman that he, uh, the mother of his child, she's wonderful. I'm, we still talk to this very day. I feel like we're like sister wives in some odd way. And um, she's great. And she's like, she actually found him um, on all uh, male dating sites. Um, his his app, his iPhone or iWatch, whatever, whatever it was, um, uploaded to their TV because it's like an Apple TV. And she went through and saw him having relations with all different men um and and like this is in their house that she lives in with this child so she they're wait, not together wait, wait she he was having guys come in the house when she was like out with the baby or something guys would come over and she had video of it or she had proof of from text me meetings it was it was videos this guy likes to record his his things like he's big with the video which is great for people like us but um to see it like she sent me one of the videos that the, the initial way that we like the way she actually reached out to me was she sent me the video via facebook message of him with another man and so i'm like who, who the heck is this i open my phone and i just i'm just casually watching i'm like oh my god so i guess maybe he just he needed a new gender because he probably maxed out all the women i don't know what his rationale is but um He's doing the same thing, but with both both genders. I mean, I think, and she saw it too. I think when someone is that um, reckless sexually with with both genders, obviously they're bisexual, but I really think they're just like hardcore sex addicts. And yes. what's scary about those people is they keep upping it and upping it, and that could be, you know, BDSF SM for with with someone then who doesn't want it, or, and I'm not at all accusing this person of it. But, you know, look at the Josh Duggard thing. You know, mm -hmm. it's he was he was seeing strippers and he was on adult websites and he was on Ashley Madison. And yep. and then they're like, okay, what's the next thing? And they exactly. go to the and next thing. And so it's like you don't know what that next thing is going to be. And it could be extremely criminal, unfortunately, for, you know, so it's just a very – I mean, if you discover someone like that that's in your life, you have got to, you know, try to get them help, but get away from them. Like, be like, go get help, but in the meantime, I'm out of here because <laughs> it is not going in a good direction. That person is sick. The problem with people like that, too, is that they don't see that there's an issue. So, like, nothing was ever his fault, and they can't admit that they did anything wrong. So trying to get them to therapy, they're like, but nothing's wrong with me. It's you. And I'm like, like, everything was always me. So it's impossible. And meanwhile, you're in love and that person doesn't exist. And it's super confusing. So when you say he had all these different lives, do you mean he had these different lives because he was seeing these other different women? Then we found out seeing men because he would drink like a crazy person behind your back. Or were there actual like fake identities that he was doing? Or just sure, he would use. Go ahead. I, I think both. Like he would have uh, multiple personalities, sure. Um, but also like he was the baseball player and he was the role model to so many people. And he played alongside, you know, the um, Super Bowl, um, the, oh my God, I can't even, World Series champions yeah. and <laughs> go sports. And um, and so he was, he loved children. He was a coach and he was a huge figure in the community, but he also like had a crazy sexual agenda and would meet up with strangers, but then had like, he had just so many different layers to him that I couldn't even keep up. And the more I found out, I was, I was like, I'm not even surprised. Like nothing can, nothing can surprise me anymore. I've seen it all. So. So when you, so the, the woman who has his child, obviously they're not together. Does she get any child support or anything from him? No, no. Mm. She's been like completely on his own, on her own. And, and, with everything. She, and does he try to visit the child or anything? No. She said that so, uh, she was for a while before she found that whole thing on the TV. She was living in the home with him. They weren't together. They were trying the, the co-parenting thing. And he would just leave sometimes without even acknowledge, not acknowledging the child. And so she's like, I'd just rather have him be completely gone, which is the yeah. wise choice. And... Mm -hmm. um. So then you you write the book, 
And has you heard anything since it's been out and available and with your success of um, promoting it on social media? Have you heard anything from him or his family? Nothing. And it's been published for two years now. And they never have once reached out. We obviously share like mutual acquaintances. Some of his family members have reached out to me and they were like, yep, this is spot on. Um, but they have never, his parents, they, I just get, I, I've heard that they just haven't read it. Um, but so when you, hurts, when you so. put the book out there, it was two years ago. And now do you feel like, it's, when did you decide to start doing TikTok? Because now it kind of got a, like a resurgence that I want people to know. Because what I love about writing a book when people you know, write a book or think about writing a book, I always say, you know, it's a piece of property. It's um, mm -hmm. it, it's timeless, whatever it is. You know, if it's your story, it's timeless. So even if you do it and maybe it's not a huge hit or maybe it doesn't get published, you still, you still have this piece of property that could be something and you can promote it later on on TikTok. You can, maybe someone will want to make a movie out of it years later. So that's what I really love about, you know, because people go, oh, books are dead or whatever. They're they're not dead. And they're such a great thing to do if you have a great story to tell. And it's very hard to do when there isn't a big paycheck making you write it. Um, but tell me a little bit about your publishing process and where the book is now, because I think that'll be really inspiring to people. Yeah. So I just... I mean, one day I opened up my MacBook and I was like, I'm going to make a book out of this story because I feel like it has a content, but it was also relatable. And if I was bringing strangers to tears, I was like, well, maybe, let's see if I can make an impact on, you know, a, for a bigger audience. So I publish um, it immediately right after publishing. It became an international bestseller in the first two weeks. And I am an independent publisher. So I don't have a, a publishing house behind me. I am my own marketing team. I'm everything. I, I just published through Amazon, which is why it's an Amazon exclusive. Um, and I'm just my own, like I'm the marketing team and I am the salesperson and I am the PR, everything. So two years goes by and it was kind of, it was fading like all things do. And TikTok came around and I felt like I had, I still had people to reach. And I'm very passionate about this subject because it's common. And so I just started posting videos on TikTok. And when I tell you the response has been so massive, I it felt like I republished the book, but even better. It surpassed my expectations. The amount of people that bought the book have been inspired to write their own book, um, have just said that they had, like I was mentioning earlier, identical experiences similar conversations and it's changed people's lives. I've stopped people from walking down the aisle, from getting married. It makes you take a second look. And it's also helps people that are in this situation and they don't even recognize the abuse because they're so caught up in like, let me help you. And that was me. I didn't even really recognize it as abuse at that time. I wasn't like, oh, I'm a victim. It was just, I was just hurting. And people are like, I think I'm in a relationship based on what you're sharing. So it's it's just like, it's uh, something I feel like this generation just really needs to talk about. It's a conversation that's just not being had. So I jumped on TikTok and relaunched my book basically. And now it's doing phenomenal. It's reached a lot of um, interest with producers. I've actually just been random producers from different TV shows that I like. Um, Dexter, you being some of the, the producers that have reached out, they just slide into my DMs and they're like, can, can we see the script? And we ended up, I, I sent my script to a few different people and there's a lot of interest around that. So I mean, it's two years old, but I mean, it's, we're just getting started with the story. I think that's so great. And did you try to go a traditional publisher route first before you did the Amazon? Yes. So I queried a bunch of different agencies and there's no like front door to the publishing world or to securing an agent or to the film world. There's just no way. So I'm, I was like, how do I get in? So I'm querying, querying, querying. And I'm just not hearing back. Nobody responds. And so I published the book. I was like, fine, let me see how, if I can do this on my own. And I did well with it. And now I'm starting to query again just with the same story because I don't have an agent. And I think, of course, it would be great to have help. And um, But there's just like no way. And I feel like I'm kind of an outlaw in that in that aspect because I've just taken the, the back door into everything, but I'm still having success with it. Um, and so there's just no wrong way to do it. I don't have anybody behind me and that's okay. And, you know, that's what I think is so great about this time, you know, um, everyone goes, oh, the internet and social media is so horrible. But then there's then there's stuff like this, you know, where people that have a dream and have a talent can make it. And, you know, and maybe their their parents aren't in the business. Maybe they aren't living in Hollywood. Maybe their dad isn't, you know, works for Simon & Schuster. <laughs> but the point is, it's like you have this in you, you know, do it. And I'm so yeah. happy that you did. And I'm so thrilled that you came on the show. The book is Between the Stitching, 
It's available on Amazon paperback. Um, so get the book, read the book, tell everybody where they can follow you if they want to um, share their thoughts, get to know you and follow you for more content. Yeah. So I'm on Instagram and TikTok and my username is the Taylor Higgins on both of those. Awesome. This is great. I mean, I have not had an opportunity to read it yet um, because we scheduled this and, and you have to order it and it takes a little bit, just a couple days from Amazon. But I am definitely going to read it and I'm so excited to see what happens because I definitely think this could be a movie. I think it would be, you know, I think it would make a great like Lifetime movie. Have you been in touch yes, with Lifetime I, people? Yes. There's a few people from Lifetime that are very interested, but people okay. are like, don't go the Lifetime route. I'm like, this this is Lifetime. This is a Lifetime classic. I think it would be great for, <laughs> for Lifetime. And then, you know, but, you know, it's going to lead to other stuff. And, and I, you wrote one book, you should write more. You know, so I'm in the process of I'm in the process of actually writing the sequel to Between the Stitching because people wanted to know what happened afterwards. And that's coming out this summer, actually. See, that's great. That's awesome. I'm thrilled. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate it, Taylor. Thank you so much for having me.